Right. All right. Good morning, Fran. Good morning, Peter. Nice to meet you. Nice uh, to meet you in person. Yeah. Uh, this is obviously going to be quite a strange interview for me because um, your husband obviously has had a profound impact on my life. Um, but it's it's an important interview. Uh, I think the Bitcoin community has this very deep love for how and will want to help you and support you in everything you're trying to do with your charity. So I appreciate you coming on. Uh, and I know this is your first in-person interview. It is, it is. And I, I can't express my gratitude enough for all the support and love that I feel from the Bitcoin community. It's it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a present yeah. for you and I forgot it, <laughs> uh, which is really annoying. So I'm going to get your address and send it. But I just want to show you something. So you probably don't know this, but uh, in the UK, I own a football team. Uh, I, I kind of heard about that a year actually. and a half ago. Yeah, right. So yeah. we got our jerseys done a year and a yeah. half ago. I'm going to show you something. I heard that you've been working out and uh, means you're ready to run. This is the back of our jersey. Oh my goodness! You see what it says there? Yeah. You know what that is? Oh yeah. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. We wanted to have a little Easter egg on our jersey. That's cool. And uh, we took the first tweet by Hal about Bitcoin, and so every everybody who wears a Real Biffa shirt has a running Bitcoin. Thing on the back, so I'll get your address afterwards. We'll send oh, you I one. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, we actually left them in LA when we drove up. <laughs> actually, we left a lot of stuff in LA. I would love that. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, how you been? I've been okay. Yeah. I mean, as okay as I can be. It's it's odd. Uh, I talk about it with my children a lot. Uh, every day, Hal's still part of my life. I don't go a day without thinking about him and wondering what his take on something would be, and. Uh, I dream about him. Last night I had three dreams with him in, in there. Uh, most of the time now his dreams, he's healthy. And it's uh, pre-ALS, so I love that because at first it wasn't like that. But um, met him, we were really young, and so he was most of my life. Yeah. Well, he's, um, he's a super important person to the world of Bitcoin. Obviously, we make a Bitcoin show. We've yeah. interviewed everyone in Bitcoin. How would have been somebody I would have interviewed if I just started this uh, a bit earlier. Right, he would have loved it. Yeah, well, yeah. I'd love to have talked to yeah. him. So it's, uh, it's a bit strange for me because normally I'm interviewing a person about themselves and obviously I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about how. Sure. So uh, there's a lot of things I won't understand. So yeah. if I say something or I get something wrong, feel free to, to correct me. But yeah. um, I am interested about uh, what, what does actually Bitcoin mean to you? Because... Obviously, it was a very important thing for Howe. He was a large contributor early on. Um, he wrote some of the most important uh, articles about Bitcoin. And uh, it's had a profound impact on the world. Yeah. You know, it, it, you know, especially you know, over the last few years, it's grown rapidly. I mean, we've traveled, we, we make documentaries, we see the impact yeah. around the world. What does it mean to you? You know, that's a complex question because it's changing and, and as time goes on. I think as time goes on, it's a more and more positive, supportive thing for me. Uh, at first, initially, when when this all started, I didn't know much about Bitcoin at all. Uh, and Hal was excited about it, but he was excited about a lot of things. I'll talk more about him uh, as we talk. But... Uh, so this was one of his big hobbies, and he was uh, doing that among a lot of other things. He'd always loved puzzles. He'd always loved challenges. So I thought of it as one of those things, kind of a game, a puzzle thing that Hal uh, was intrigued in. And then we became involved in the ALS, and that kind of took over my part of life for a long time. And then at the very end of his life, actually, Bitcoin was a scary negative thing to me because we had a few things we can talk about later that uh, were very frightening. And it wasn't Bitcoin itself, but it was people who were threatening us because of Bitcoin. Right. And uh, so that, that was very negative and scary. And then gradually, as time has passed, I've moved past that and looked more into and learned more about Bitcoin myself and also met some wonderful people who are associated with Bitcoin and the Bitcoin community. So now I, I would say that mostly I feel gratitude and hope and I'm excited about Bitcoin, but it's it's changing. It's it's 
an ongoing process continues to build and get better and better. I think uh, people are going to be really excited to hear from you and will be very supportive of the work you're doing with ALS and hopefully uh, donate some of their Bitcoin. And and I also think people will be concerned about some of the things you're going to talk about later on. But let's um, let's just let's dial it back a bit. How did how did you and how meet and how old were you? <laughs> Oh my, okay. So Hal and I met in college. Uh, I was actually two years ahead of him. Okay. We both went to Caltech, California Institute of Technology. Uh, we were both, uh, I guess people would consider both of us as nerds. Both of us were super good students in high school, super studious. But uh, at the point where we met, I was on scholarship uh, and I needed to keep an A average because... Uh, I came from an entirely different background. And Hal was two years behind me and uh, totally enjoying the, uh, the whole situation of being with uh, people at Caltech. So he was just this excited, enthusiastic, two years younger than the person. Uh, and, uh, the, and I just, I was mesmerized by him. I, I the, uh, I was so impressed by him. I have to say, I pursued him. And this was kind of strange at Caltech because we had a uh, seven males to one female ratio there. So I had so plenty you had of- you had a yeah, choice. so I had plenty of guys who were trying to go after me, but I was interested in Hal. He was just so unique. He was so, he was so enthusiastic, so well-rounded, so brilliant. Uh, and so I, I just thought, oh, this guy, I gotta get to know him better. Uh, so was it a- a real pursuit? <laughs> uh, subtle pursuit. <laughs> subtle pursuit. <laughs> I waited until I graduated, then we started going together once I was out of there because the whole situation there was crazy. But I, we were close friends for those first two years. So he was 18 and I was actually 19 when we first met. What was he studying and what were you studying? I was studying pre-med okay. and biology. Uh, and Hal was, he started out as a math major. Uh-huh. And then he switched to computer science. That all makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. Math major to computer yeah. science. Yeah. And so I guess uh, when he started to uh, express an interest in coding and developing and some of the things the cypherpunk groups of people were doing, you were kind of, you would. You would see in that kind of early stage of where he oh, was. Oh, he was pre. Was. He was pre that. He came into Caltech at, at, in junior high back when they didn't even. I, I learned about this later through his family. Yeah. But when he was in junior high, he had a sister who was ten years older than him in in uh, college, and she was studying. She was taking a Fortran class, and so he was. He read her books and he taught himself Fortran. And then the junior high school, they used him. They used to have these little, I don't know what they call it, punch cards mm -hmm. to, uh, to do their, uh, compute, their coding on. And uh, they, Hal became the person who did all the, the programming in Fortran for his junior high school. So even way back there, he, he was interested in that kind of thing. He was interested in puzzles. He was interested in magic. Uh, from childhood on and doing kind of optical il illusions and uh, that sort of thing. Um, so. And a lot of the early work the kind of cypherpunks did, they, yeah. they were very interested in uh, technologies which would limit the uh, kind of scope of government and the yes. reach of government. And so, you know, when you're dating him early on, did he express those thoughts? Oh, yes. Scared? Oh, yes. Was he a pan passionate rebel, rebel? Oh, yes. He definitely was. Um, we had a lot of discussions about that. He taught me a lot. I, I came in from a very traditional, uh, liberal, democratic uh, background. Uh, my my mom was a Holocaust survivor, and and okay. uh, my father came from a not wealthy family, East Coast. And uh, actually, my dad had a lot of depression, so he was out of a job a lot of the time. And so when I, that's why I was on scholarship at Caltech. Okay. Uh, and he, uh, so we, we did a lot of moving around. It was a very different background. And Hal's family, very different. His family was very conventional, and he was a little rebel. <laughs> uh, how, how did he express that rebel side? 
he just did what he wanted to, and he got away with it, <laughs> as far as I could tell. Um, but uh, his family was kind of ambiguous religion-wise, and Hal was a staunch atheist from pretty young. Uh, and uh, But he was anti-government or anti-control, that kind of rebel side? Because a lot of the... Like even the pre-Bitcoin uh, work that was done by uh, various other people who were trying yeah. to develop something like Bitcoin, it was always to try and build money that was more private. Yes. And uh, respect the privacy of individuals, like pr privacy being a fundamental pillar of democracy. Yeah, Hal was very big on a person's right to privacy. Uh, he also was a very trusting person. and He was a libertarian and he felt that anyone that people would choose to do the right thing given the opportunity. He had just a lot of faith in humanity. He was a futurist. He believed that the future was going to be beautiful, that things would just go that way, that people given a choice would make good choices. And this harm no other person thing, he, he, didn't, he didn't believe religion was necessary, that people shouldn't, that it wasn't necessary to have punishment or reward in order to make an ethical and good choice. He just, he, had, he trusted people. Huh. And so do you remember when he first brought the idea of Bitcoin and talked to you about that he discovered Bitcoin? Yeah, I, I do. But at the time, I didn't take it seriously. I think it was more, he, he was excited about it as a, a cool puzzle kind of thing as a as a or at least that's how I saw it as a as a really cool uh, exercise in in trying to to create something and I didn't take it seriously I just took it as oh well this is neat this is something that Hal's interested in it's it's very uh, it has potential but a lot of things have potential well, I mean, yeah. we're, we're all like that the first time. Most yeah. of us the first time, yeah. we don't take it seriously. Yeah. Or I didn't take it seriously. It took me four years to take it seriously. Took you four, yeah, it took me four years to take it seriously. And and I discovered it after it had been around for six years. Yeah. And so I think a lot of us go yeah. through that. But obviously Hal saw something in it. Hal was interested in developing it. I mean, he was really interested in the whole potential but um, I don't really, I couldn't get inside his mind, so I couldn't tell you how much he was, he believed it was going to be where it is now. I think he'd be thrilled. What was that I, famous I, quote? When he first realized that it was actually being used as a currency, he was ecstatic. I mean, at that point, he was pretty far into his ALS, but mm. it, I remember he was just so excited about it. Uh, that first Christmas that he used Bitcoin to purchase presents for all of us. And I couldn't, I didn't know about it. He got my son to help him because at that point he wasn't doing things on his own anymore. He couldn't use his hands. I think he was having trouble even using his eyes with the computer, but he got Jason to, uh, to do some transactions for him. And he was, and he was so excited. I was, cause he obviously um, was thinking about like a, like how if Bitcoin prolif proliferates, what this sort of impact on the world would be? Because he, he tweeted in Jan two thousand nine, so you know yeah. a couple of weeks after, saying yeah. think about how to reduce the CO two emissions from a widespread Bitcoin implementation. Which, oh which wow, is, which is pretty amazing. It's an yeah. incredible quote, and the reason it's an incredible thing for him to quote right then, yeah. two weeks after. Right. When was it, Jan? So the protocol wow. had been live for two weeks, two, week, two three weeks. It's, this is one of the biggest challenges we have as Bitcoin is that people challenge the idea of how much uh, um, energy Bitcoin uses and whether it's bad for the environment. But actually, we know that Bitcoin has been used to, uh, um, Bitcoin mining, sorry, has been used to uh, incentivize the build out of uh, green energy. Yeah. And we also know that Bitcoin, a lot of Bitcoin miners use wasted energy. So to be that, uh, to, to have that foresight two weeks in is... <laughs> See, I didn't even know about that. Yeah, so yeah, one. that's amazing. That came out a couple of years yeah. ago and everyone's like, yeah. wow. Wow. So obviously, I mean, he would be amazed by the growth and progress oh, since he then. Would. He would. Yeah. Um, so we need, obviously need to talk about his, his illness. Um, yeah. And 
I, I want to know as much about it as possible so I understand and you know people listening really understand yeah. because I know it is a it's a complex illness um but at what age did you first start to realize there was something up and, and was it him or you that noticed it was really it hit really fast he was fine 2008 uh, he was fine in January 2009, as far as I could tell. I think around February of 2009, I started noticing some very subtle things in him. His speech just didn't sound quite right. And we used to run together. And, and the first thing I noticed was that when we were running together, that he wouldn't, he wouldn't talk to me while he was running. And he, or, or he would talk, but he would be very out of breath, even if we were running slowly. And that struck me as odd. So I made some comment about that to him. And he said, well, of course I'm out of breath, I'm running. So he didn't notice it. Uh, and then I, I just noticed a few speech patterns that sounded a little wrong and I pointed it out to him and he thought I was being picky. <laughs> and, and critical. So so I noticed those things first. And then I think it was probably around, he was training at that point for a marathon because he wanted to, to uh, qualify for Boston for that year. Yeah. And uh, so he started noticing that he was having more t trouble recovering from his training runs. And we went and saw an orthopedist who the orthopedist said, oh, you're just getting old. How old was he yeah. at the time? Uh, 53. Okay, so that's not old. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm 68 now. So, no, no. But but anyway, they could kind of pushed that down. So that was all early 2009. Then he started noticing, and these all seemed to be separate things, that his right hand felt uncoordinated, and he was having a hard time writing. The writing was the first thing. He could still type. Uh, and that was still early 2009. But we started going to doctors because we didn't know what we, it started. Just more things kept happening, and I I think it was around May of 2009 that a neurologist sent him to UCLA to be tested for ALS, and he was diagnosed. They did a lot of tests because you don't want something to be ALS. Uh, right now and back then, even more ALS is a um, it's not understood. It's almost a diagnosis of exclusion. You exclude, every, there's no test. Unless you have genetic ALS, which is one subset of it, but otherwise uh, there's no comprehensive test where you can say, oh, this person has ALS. It's more that you rule out everything else that it could be. Because there's no markers for it. There's no, uh, at that time, there were no markers at all. Now there are a few, it, it's uh, becoming better understood. The research really is helping. And one thing that we do understand is that there are a lot of subtypes of ALS. It's kind of an umbrella term, like using the term cancer. Mm -hmm. If you use the term cancer, it, and you can't treat all cancers the same. You don't take cancer and give them a certain kind of chemotherapy or excise a certain type of tissue. It, it, they're all treated differently, and ALS is like that. So that's part of the issue is discovering and understanding better what ALS is so that you can look at all the different subgroups and say, okay, well, this is this kind of ALS and that's what they need. And they, we don't really have that yet, but we're getting there. So we're getting better with treatments and still not that much there. When Hal had it, when Hal was diagnosed, really the only thing we knew were two d genetic types. You could test for that. Person didn't have it. Then you could test to see if they had, if they had MS. You could test to see if they had um, a brain tumor. You could test to see if they had a lot of different things, um, different kinds of uh, toxic poisonings, uh, Lyme disease. There were just a litany of things you could test for. And he tested negative on everything they tested him for, so then they gave him the diagnosis of ALS. And uh, how common or rare is ALS as a condition? It's, it, it is... Being diagnosed and, and new, new uh, diagnoses of it show up more than MS, more than Parkinson's, but people don't live that long. So the, if you look at the numbers of people who are alive living with ALS, it's uh, a lot less. 
Right. Because their survival is not that good. It's better now than it was when Hal had it. I think back then the the average life expectancy, if you didn't go on life support, was two to three years, and now it's more like four to five years. Okay. So I I think the first time I'd ever heard of ALS was in relation to how yeah. I think it was. And then we had the global ice bucket challenge. Yeah. Where the there was a, a real kind of uh, awareness, like an awakening where people became more aware of this condition. Uh, and then since then, it's something that I've heard a lot, lot more about because um, it seems to be very random who... Uh, is struck down with ALS, but in the UK, it's we've had say a couple of uh, well-known rugby players who've yeah. uh, had ALS, and and so and they've had very good documentaries about it, and so yeah. you get to, you started to learn about it. But previously, I, I I'd never even heard of it, um, and so I don't know much about it at all. But when you say it's an umbrella term, could, uh, could you actually explain what it is as a? Like, is it referred to as a disease or a condition? It's a progressive neurological degenerative disease. Okay. Uh, people consider it a, a disease, but it's not, as far as we understand, contagious. So it's mm-hmm. not a contagious disease. It would be more on the order of the kind of thing like Parkinson's disease. Okay. It, it's, uh, it's, and in Europe, it's often referred to as MND, motor neuron yes. disease, which I think is probably a better name for it. But we've called it ALS here in the United States uh, ever since uh, Lou Gehrig had mm-hmm. it. Uh, it's not actually, and that stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, but that's not really as accurate a descriptor. It's too specific. Right. Uh, uh, talking about the specific kind of degeneration. They do look for certain things. I don't want to take the whole time here talking about ALS, but they do look for certain things when they're looking for ALS to differentiate it from other diseases. And one thing is that you have to have uh, something called upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron degeneration. And upper motor neuron is going from the brain to the spinal cord and lower mo- motor neuron from the spinal cord to the muscles. So you find it in both areas, not just in one or one of the two. Because uh, a lot of these other diseases, it's just in one of the two. Okay. Uh, and, and then there's a few other things that they look for. To f- and what is understood about what is happening to the body with somebody who has ALS? Yeah. The, uh, the motor neurons are the nerves that go from all, all the way from the brain to the muscles and they tell the muscles what to do. Nothing to do with sensation. So they don't do anything about what you can feel. So for example, if a person were a quadriplegic in a standard way and and they didn't have any communication between their brain and their lower body, they wouldn't feel anything. They're, they're, they're not only paralyzed, but they also don't feel things. Uh, with, uh, with ALS, uh, you can still feel your senses are normal, but you can't do anything. You can't move. So it, it's kind of a strange thing because you feel things, which means you feel pain. And also when it first starts happening, it feels like everything is normal, but you're just not able to get things to work. And that's part of what threw Hal at the beginning is his hand kind of felt normal, but when he tried to move it, it just sat there. It's not like when your hand goes to sleep or your foot goes to sleep. It felt normal. But then he would try to do something and the hand would just not work right. And uh, so that the, it's kind of nice, I guess, in a way that you can feel, but it's also bad because you feel pain. Hmm. And, uh, And you can feel if you have a bed sore, but you can't do anything to move off of it. Right. So it must have been a... A very frustrating uh, progressive disease for someone yeah. like Hallow anyone to have, especially as someone who's been so mobile, used to running and yeah. you know, used to doing his computer work. Yeah. Um, and so, did he struggle with coping with it? Was it was was there a lot of frustration? Or I would say that of course there was frustration, but Hal handled it better than. 
I would ever handle it or that most people handle it. He, he would figure out a way to get around it. When, for example, when he first started not being able to use his right hand, he figured out how to type just using his left hand. And he got really good at it. So he was typing fast with just his left hand. And then when he couldn't use his left hand anymore, and he had to learn how to use the eye gaze machine with his computer, he figured out, he programmed a way to use it so that he could do it better than the programs that were available to him. And he had to use his eyes to do this programming, but he, and he found all these different ways to, to, to be faster. And I mean, he, he was just, when he couldn't eat anymore, he was okay with that. He said, even though he loved eating, he was like a person who loved to eat. Uh, he was okay with it. He, he got over it. He just accepted things. Uh, I think what was hardest for me was watching him be so accepting and then something else would be taken away from him. Right. So, he, I mean, and the worst, of course, was when he couldn't communicate anymore. Right. But one by one, things were taken away from him. And he always managed somehow to say, okay, well, now how can I deal with this? How can I deal with not being able to blink anymore when I use my computer. Okay, well, I'll learn how to use my eye movement more efficiently. Uh, how am I going to be able to deal with not being able to scratch when I feel an itch? Well, I'm going to learn to ignore it. Uh, how am I going to learn how I'm going to deal with pain? Well, I'm going to figure out ways to not focus on it. I mean, it was insane. Couldn't stand it. <laughs> it hurts me to even think about it because he was too good. He was too good. Uh, I, but I think that's comforting to hear in some ways. I think people want to hear that about how, yeah. like, that he is that, that he was that person. So, but we also, people want to support you. You've obviously made it an important yeah. part of your work to raise money, raise awareness, and raise support. So, what is, where, in terms of kind of, research and in uh, um, the treatments that are available, what kind of progress has been made? One thing is that we understand much more okay. about ALS. So I think a lot has been uh, done with understanding not only that there are a lot of different forms, but starting to identify them. Uh, at first, also in terms of genetics, there are two, there have been for a long time, to clear-cut genetic uh, types, forms that people were able to identify. They ran in families. It was dominant. If a person had that gene, then they, had, they would develop ALS probably at some point. But now they're realizing that there are, I, don't, I should have done my research before coming yeah, here, fine. but there are large numbers of genes that are associated with a higher likelihood of developing ALS and that having um, more of them makes it more likely. However, that none of them cause ALS on their on their own. It's just more that we're seeing that seeing these genes, seeing these genetic um, patterns, means it's more likely that a person would be susceptible to developing it. And then we're also understanding more what kinds of things might take a susceptible person and cause them to develop ALS. For example, you see rugby players mm. being hit in the head. Uh, most people, that's fine. You know, you have, a, you have concussions, whatever. Maybe you have some brain damage. But for someone who's very highly susceptible, that can bring on ALS. Uh, or overheating, severe overheating, certain types of exposures to toxic chemicals. Most people, fine. And that's why we hadn't been able to find a cause for ALS because in I don't know, 99% of the time people have these things happen to them and they're fine. But if a person is more susceptible, not so fine. Right. So, so just identifying that, that's big. That's, that's really uh, come a long way. So that, that's number one. Number yeah. two is looking at treatments. Uh, we are seeing part of the reason why we haven't been able to find treatments is because the term I used, umbrella, there are so many different conditions that we classify as ALS. And let's say there is one treatment that seems to help some people, but it's not statistically significant. If we could take 
the subset of people that it helps and understand what's different about them. Why does it help these people and not these other people? So, uh, and then we could be able to take treatments and say, well, this person has this kind of ALS and this treatment will be helpful for that person. So there's a lot of research being done in that direction of understanding more about subtypes and what treatments might help those subtypes. So I, I think that is good. What, what I'm not seeing enough of, and maybe that's not just ALS, is how do we take a person who has ALS, who has all of this damage, and repair it? And I don't think too much has happened there. That, that's a whole different level versus just taking someone who has it and stopping it and fixing it so that they they're where they, so that there's no more damage. And then the body heals to the degree that it's able to. But if you take someone who's severely damaged, where they have no mobility, where they're essentially quadriplegic, I don't know if there's, a, that there's still a lot to be done there. And the research the work and what people are yeah. doing, it's how much is that leading towards uh, Actual medical treatments. Are there certain medical treatments that are, 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 that are available now? And also, are there any things with regards to uh, exercise that are encouraged? Anything outside of medicine that's encouraged? Yeah. Very good question. Uh, we're still medically throwing everything at people. So we have now, I believe, four treatments that are medications and that, that have been shown to be statistically significant in improving and in, in slowing down progression of ALS. Now, they don't help everyone, but the standard, at least here in the US, is to have a person take all four of them. And I, I think it's four, it might, might just be three. There's a, a fourth that's on the docket right now. It, it does seem like I'm seeing people progress more slowly, though, so I think that hitting them with everything has been helpful. But there are side effects to some of those medications, so if a person isn't going to benefit from them, it's probably not the best thing for them to have to take them. Uh, so that was part of your question. The other uh, part was, uh, are there other recommendations like exercise, yeah, exercise. swimming, walking? Yeah, okay. So... Yes, but it's tricky. If a person is losing the, the what once a motor neuron starts to break down, a person people adapt. It's a little bit like a, a person with post what they used to call post polio. So the remaining motor neurons adapt to try to take over for the ones that have died. Right. And if you so there's to a to a degree a little bit of exercise can keep a person healthy a little bit of exercise can keep a person functioning you don't want them to atrophy yeah. through disuse but too much can push them over the edge and over stress those muscle those motor neurons that are trying really hard to take the place of the ones that are sick and it can actually damage them so it, at least uh, the best advice we can really give a person is to exercise to a comfort, to comfort level, not to push like an athlete anymore, mm. not to train for a race, but to run because it feels good if they're still able to run. And if they're tired the next day, take a day off. So no more, not training per se. It's not like Parkinson's where you can push. Okay. You, you can't push because you can overdo it. I have an example with Hal there where we didn't know he had ALS yet, and he was running the Los Angeles Marathon in, I believe it was May of 2009, because he wanted to qualify for Boston. And things were already going wrong, so he kept having these overuse injuries, and his speech was already messed up, but we didn't know he had ALS. And he started, he ran, he was doing all kinds of things to try to, keep training. He had developed this form of running called chi running, I think, 
where it was a kind of a more relaxed run. And he still wanted to qualify for Boston, though. So he started the LA Marathon, and uh, halfway through, he cramped up and he couldn't walk. And I had to somehow get to him with the car, and, and, and Los Angeles was closed off, and, and park as close as I could to him, and then kind of help him hobble to the car. So that was overuse, but we didn't know that. Yeah. After that, he couldn't run as far anymore. So he decided, okay, I'm not going to try for the Boston Marathon, but I still want to race. I still want to run. And he had his mind set on this uh, Disney half marathon, which we were going to run together. So we ran that together really slowly. He knew he couldn't race anymore. By the time he ran it, actually, he knew he had ALS, but he wanted to do it. Okay. So we finished it. And at that time, it was really slow for him, but it was not for me because I'm not a distance runner. So we ran the half marathon in about a nine-minute pace, and Hal probably could have done it in a seven-minute pace a year earlier. Okay. Uh, but we did it in a nine-minute pace, and I thought he was slow because he was trying to be with me. And uh, at the end, but we didn't talk because I already knew he couldn't talk while running. And at the end, I said, Hal, that was so nice. Thank you for running it at my pace. And he, and he kind of panted out, I wasn't running it at your pace. That was the best I could do. And then it turned out that the next day he was all cramped up. And then the next day he was still all cramped up. And it, a long story short, that was the last run he ever did. After okay. that, he never ran again. What was his, um, he, he did run marathons so pr prior to <sighs> He mostly ran half marathons, and his goal, his bucket list, was to run the, the Boston Marathon. What's his, what was his half marathon time? Seven minute miles? So 30, yeah, it was like averaging was seven minute miles, so I, I don't know. 70, what's yeah. that, 91 minutes? So that's just over an hour and a half. That's a good Yeah, quick. about that, yeah. That's a, yes, a, yeah. That's a good half yeah, marathon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. For, was for me, if I could go under two hours, I was happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I did one half marathon. I think it was about two hours. Yeah, a long time that, was, ago. That, was, that was my uh, goal was under two hours. Try to go for under two hours. Are you still running? Yes, but not very, <laughs> not very competitive anymore. I, I'm 68, and I, I'm kind of plagued with the normal age things. And so, I mean, I feel so lucky to be able to run, though. Yeah, but not uh, two hours. No, I'm not running distances. <laughs> <laughs> So in terms of research, um, how much work is being done to raise money uh, for the research? And is there any uh, government support? And is, is this a global effort? Yeah. Uh, I think there are a lot of separate efforts to raise money for uh, research. It's such a big cost, though, so I don't think that so far that enough money ha has been raised. Uh, during you, you mentioned earlier about the uh, global ice box, I think it was. Yeah, ice, ice bucket challenge. Ice bucket Did challenge, you do right. That? That I was didn't in, do it, but I remember it. <laughs> that was in 2014, the year how passed. So it was kind of cool because he got to see that. Yeah, right. But that year there was a big up in funds and that really made a difference. That one year, the funding, uh, is made a big jump. And that's, I think, why things are better now than they were when Hal had at ELS, because it all happened after he passed. But since then, things have kind of petered out and fundraising hasn't been that that great. Uh, it's not, you, compared to even just breast cancer, it's, it's a tiny bit. Uh, and of course, I shouldn't say just breast cancer, but as opposed to all cancer. Uh, breast cancer as by itself, is raising a lot more funds than uh, ALS and cancer overall, hugely more funds, uh, Parkinson's more funds. So it's, it's kind of a tough one. Uh, I've been working with a group in the Bitcoin community. We're doing a, a an annual challenge. We started it three years ago. Uh, it's uh, called running Bitcoin and we named it after uh, Hal's, uh, tweet on January 10th. So we didn't, we tie it to that date. Uh, 
to the date when he tweeted in 2009, uh, mm -hmm. January 10th. But um, I'm really, I, I'm hopeful that this is going to be a big thing. Uh, I think in some ways, I, I was, I've been really excited by the response we had the first couple of years mm. uh, and last year. And each year it's grown a little bit more. But I think it would be incredible if the Bitcoin community was the community that made the difference with ALS. And if, if that community, if our community was the community that was able to actually change things so that it doesn't afflict people and end people's lives in such a horrible way that the way it did for Hal. Uh, well, we'll do yeah. everything we can to support it. How does the fundraiser work? Obviously, it's running Bitcoin. Hal was a big runner. Yeah. What, what, what are you asking people to do? Well, it's a couple of things. So we, because Hal enjoyed running so much and it's, and then it ties with the running Bitcoin uh, tweet, we thought it would be fun to have a run associated with it, but it's global, so everyone runs on their own. And picking a distance for people to try to run, we thought, well, Hal's favorite run, the, the one that he did the most races, the one that he did his, most of his workouts was a half marathon. So we've kind of tied it to that, to the uh, distance of a half marathon. Danny? I'll do it. Yeah, right. yeah. We're in. But it doesn't have to be done all at once. So it can be spread out. So a person can do. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I do. I don't do it all at once. So I spread it out over three days. So yeah. uh, I might need a bit longer. <laughs> 13 days. Um, but we, we, look, we'll do everything we can do to support you. One, we will contribute. We will also take part. And yeah. We will spread the news. And, and I do hope the Bitcoiners will support you. And I think they will. And I think they'll support this because there is this deep love for how he's this figure. He's, he's for a lot of us, it's very strange because um, a lot of us joined the world of Bitcoin after how. And so. Yeah, you know, a lot of us just read his writings, know his tweets, know his yeah. work, but never actually got to know him. You know, there's not um, there wasn't the podcast scene, so we don't have how podcasts to refer back to. Yeah, you know, um, but he is so loved by people who's never met him. Well, that must be a bit strange as well for you. That yeah, I love it. I mean, that's part of why I've morphed over the years to the feelings that I have about Bitcoin now compared with where I was uh, at the beginning. Uh, the community has been so supportive. And I love, I, I, I'm touched by how much people appreciate how I appreciate him. But of course I would. I, I met him, we were kids, we lived together. I got to, I was lucky to have him. Uh, but we, are you aware of just how much he is thought of? It's kind of shocking to me and in a wonderful way, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so we will we will do everything we can to to support him. I do have a few few more questions before we finish. Yeah. Um, and um, I'll be as sensitive as I can, but just towards the end of Hal's life, like, what, did he give kind of the express uh, thoughts about uh, what he, you know, like his legacy or what he'd like to see from the world, like uh, any kind of like. I don't. I'm trying to be very careful with my words. I don't want to be insensitive, but yeah, did he leave thoughts with you or ideas with you? You know, that was one of the most painful parts of his ALS. Is the first thing he lost was his voice. The second thing he lost really was his ability to communicate with his hands, then with his eyes. Then it became so difficult, even for him to say yes or no. And at the very end, the last year of his life was pretty much a nightmare. He, okay. he couldn't even say yes or no reliably. We were just trying to keep him alive. We didn't want to have him in a hospital. Uh, he didn't want to live in a hospital. So we had him at home. And uh, my son and I were his full-time caregivers. Right. We, we just stayed with him. I learned everything I could about nursing and uh, changing dressings. He was in and out of the hospital. Hospital was a nightmare because he had no way to communicate there. I would spend the night with him there uh, to make sure that he wasn't mistreated. He had bed sores. He he couldn't. It, it was really a nightmare. I mean, right. he even he couldn't get on a toilet. That's pretty obvious. But he yeah. couldn't even use a bedpan. We had to do things 
to stimulate that. So it, I, I, I was surprised that he even wanted to stay alive. But what he said was that at that uh, so so in terms of his communication with me towards the end of his life, I would say the last two years minimal and the last year really almost nothing except yes or no. The way that we would say yes or no was uh, I would ask him a question that could be answered with a yes or no. And the only thing he could do with his eyes at that point was either move them up or move them back and they would get stuck up. So I'd ask him a question. If you move them up, that meant yes. But then if I would ask him the same question as a no, and if it was still up, then I knew they were stuck up. And then we'd have to keep asking that same question until we got a yes or no. So that's even how we figured out that uh, he was able to communicate to us about his end of life choices and when he wanted them and where he wanted them through this very tedious trying to figure out the right questions to ask him. Right. So it was pretty awful. Uh, those years are, are, are very traumatic. And, and at the very end of it, when he was in this state where all he could do was be a body, feel pain, and say yes or no, was when we started getting threats and uh, people saying uh, that, trying to extort Bitcoin from us. And uh, so that was happening while he was still alive. While he was still alive, it, it's it, there. We had an, an attack, what, what was called a um, a SWAT, yeah, where someone uh, called in and said that he was going to kill everyone in the house. He said he was Hal and that he was going to kill everyone in the house. So the police came in and and uh, I happened to have Hal in the shower at the time, naked. He was on life support, so it was very tricky to shower him because we had to disconnect him from, from breathing quickly and then put him back on, and that's when it happened. And I got a pounding on the door, and uh, I had my son in with, with him and uh, went to race to the door, and they were, the police were out there, and they wouldn't let me go back in to, to Hal. They wouldn't let me go back in. That's horrific. So it was horrific. So, yeah. so, uh, so then they were pounding on the door. And, and so anyway, we got how I was outside screaming and uh, Jason got him outside naked, wet with his life support back on and he was shivering and, uh, and they all ran into the house, uh, at the, the police, cause they thought someone was in there threatening our lives. And I was screaming and I said, Kim, I need a blanket for him. I need a blanket for him. He's, he's shaking, he's shivering. And he was just there turning blue and shaking and shivering. And I, I still remember that because that was just really horrible. Mm. And then after that was all over, the guy who, who had done this called us again and he kept calling us. He called himself Bitcoin Troll. And he said, I'm gonna keep doing things to you until your husband dies. And, and, he, and, he, um, and he threatened to have our power, I, th I think he did get our power turned off at one point and Hal was on life support, but we had a, um, we had a backup generator, so it was okay. But then I had to go and change all of it. I had to put a, do things so that the power company would not turn off our power anymore, even if someone called and pretended to be us and, and asked them to. And so it was really crazy. So this was all at the end, end of Hal's life. Who does this? Bitcoin troll. Yeah, but like, <laughs> but like, I just don't understand the mentality of this. Uh, yeah, it, and um, did the police ever find them? Well, the FBI got involved actually, and uh, about three years later, they found him. Really? Yeah. Prosecuted? Uh, he killed himself when they found him. They found him dead inside of his uh, house in. And he was in the United States, but then this this wasn't the only. Um, I think it was in 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 West Virginia or some crazy place like that, hiding. Uh, but that was not the only time you were harassed. No, that wasn't the only time. We also had some things from in 2017 after Hal passed. Uh, we had a second uh, big. We had we've had a lot of minor harassment uh, issues, but we had another big one uh, in 2017 where uh, someone managed to uh, do a, they, it started in, I think in Eastern Europe, but, but it was a large group of uh, 
people. They had someone in New York City involved who did a, a SIM swap of phones. So they got our phone, my son's, my, my phone and my daughter's phone. And then they uh, used the phones to access our iCloud and our Google accounts and uh, took over those. And then they used that, that information to get our, um, our storage of our, I had all of my documents and, and personal things uh, stored on the, on, the, uh, on the cloud and they, they got that. Uh, uh, I forget the name of the company that we were using, but it was legitimate because they had our phones and they were able to do it that way. So, um, that's an unnecessary amount of additional stress to be put through. Yeah, so that that is why I've been keeping a low profile. I finally decided to come out of hiding again. Well, I'm but... glad you did. <laughs> and I really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. But I'm really sorry you've been put through all that. Because uh, I, th I, th I think you've had to go through enough without people who are clearly aware of what you've been through putting you through more. And so I'm I'm really sorry that's happened. The worst was with Hal alive. That one was mm. that one was the second one was very very bad and and stressful. But the one with Hal alive, I think it it had an impact on him deciding to end his life. I mean, not that his life was that much fun for him at that point. I think his life must have been pretty uh, miserable. But he wasn't going to end it. Would you talk about his end of life choice? Because it's pretty common knowledge. Amongst Bitcoin for yeah, a decision yeah. he took, which was to be crypto, cryo, sorry, crypto. I mean, lost in the Bitcoin world there, cryo yeah. preserved. Yeah, at Alcor. Uh, yeah. We had signed up for Alcor back in the 90s. Okay. Uh, we knew Max Moore, the, uh, who was the, uh, at the time the CEO over there. But, but uh, we were part of an extropian group. And I think um, Hal is not a believer, nor am I. We're not religious people. Hal is a confirmed atheist. And in the same way, he, he wasn't a believer in the way that some people are of um, cryonics, but he did feel that he had two choices, which was either to die or to maybe someday be uh, brought back to life. And he was such a an, an optimist about uh, the future. He wanted to see the future. Yeah. So that's why we made that choice back in the 90s. Now, to actually activate that choice, I think he had intended to put it off for as long as possible. And, you know, let technology, let medical knowledge continue to progress. But uh, at this point, uh, he was on life support. We did have that kind of in our back pocket. Okay. As something that he could go to when, when he decided to end his life. So he is cryopreserved. His body is pretty much messed up by the ALS, though. So he's cryopreserved. And Alcor did a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. I was there. I watched it. I, I wanted to watch it. So I watched everything. Hold on. <laughs> You, uh, what, I watched it. What, yeah. are you, what are you actually watching? Explain to me specifically. Oh, it's very complex. Yeah. Even back in 2014, you can't just take a body and freeze it because the uh, water will expand and it's going to cause a lot of cellular damage. So they've done a lot of studies. I, I'm not the person to talk to you about this in technical yeah. detail at all, but it's based on what they do when they cryo, when they freeze body parts. Yeah. And same same kind of thing. So you don't want any kind of cellular damage. And that here we're talking about an entire body. So they did a, a lot to drain his body. They were t monitoring him the whole time, monitoring body temperature, monitoring all kinds of uh, electrolyte levels. I don't know. I, I don't even know. But they lots of monitoring. Okay. They had... Um, doctors and vets on site, veterinarians <laughs> doing all this work. Uh, and, uh, and then once they did that, then they infu they perfused him. I don't know, infused, perfused with a, something that freezes. So they did that. And then they lowered his temperature very gradually, and they were monitoring that. And then they put him into these uh, preserve tank things. So it took quite a long time. It was an overnight process, hours. And I just watched the whole thing. Uh, 
That must have been a strange experience watching that. Yeah, I'd already been in a strange experience watching him at the hospital. We took yeah, him off true. life yeah. support. And then Hal's body decided to stay alive off life support for the longest time. So I was watching him and thinking, oh, my God, what's he going through? And they were, they were uh, at the hospital and, and watching his oxygen levels. And I was freaking out because his oxygen levels were dropping and dropping. And I'm thinking, this can't be good for him. He's going to have brain damage. And they said, OK, we're taking the oxygen pulse oximeter off because I was freaking out watching that. So they took him off the pulse oximeter. Oximeter, and he just, I stayed with him, holding his feet and talking to him. And it was 18 hours, 18 hours. He'd been on life support. We were afraid to take him off life support for more than a minute. And he was 18 hours yeah. alive. But based on everything you've told me about him, are you, are you, I'm not actually surprised. Ugh. So anyway, I'm up with him 18 hours. My kids were there, but they went off to go to sleep. And then he died. So I, uh, so then we rushed him off to Alcor. I called the kids to say, we're going to Alcor. And they rushed him off on ice. It was like almost next door. Mm -hmm. And then I watched him as we did the cryopreservation. So I think I must have gone like 36 hours without sleep, something like that. And so now he's kept in, is it essentially a tank? Yes. Okay. And is it a... You, you don't, it doesn't float in the tank? Is it fixed? I'm just so in, intrigued by this. Yeah, you know, I, I'm going to have to refer you to someone else because yeah. I just watched the process. <laughs> okay. And after that, it's like, okay. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Do you, but I, belie I you believe it's floating. There. No, I haven't. No. I haven't. And um, that's a big choice. I mean, it's an interesting choice. I, I, I mean, it leaves open so many other questions. Um, but I, I, I don't feel I need to do them now. Um, yeah, I'm signed up, and I promised Hal I would be signed up, so that way someday maybe we can both be together again. <laughs> uh, like I said, I'm not a believer. I'm not a religious person. I would love it. And in, in, for it to help for Hal, they're going to have to find not only a cure for ALS, but a reversal for all of that damage, because otherwise he's going to be a non-moving body again. But I figure if they can figure out a way to bring someone back to life, at that point, they could be able to do all of they'll that. They'll be able to. It's all going to be nanotechnology. It's all going to be little tiny um, subcellular things walking or running around and fixing <laughs> cellular damage. You'll, so, you'll also be an older lady to him. You'll be 10 years older. I'm going to be a lot older. I mean, right <laughs> now, he, he was. Well, from now, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you could be 20 years older. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was 58. When he okay, died, sixty-eight. I'm going to be. I'm sixty-eight now. I'm going to be sixty-nine in January. I'm planning on living to at least a hundred. Okay, so, so uh, you're 30, 42 years older. <laughs> but then, uh, I mean, if if they can, if they, if they can, can bring repair back, ALS, they can bring people back to youth. Also, yeah. Hey. yeah. I don't know what age I'd want to be. If I think about thirty-five was it? Yeah, about thirties, forties. I think yeah. that'd be good. Don't want to be too young. Yeah, I think 40s are okay. Yeah. Um, and definitely that's something I think we need to uh, look into a bit more. But I think 50s were good too until I got ALS. I mean, hell, 60s are not bad. <laughs> not, I'm not there yet. <laughs> Five years. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be 70s, so I'll, I'll let you know if that's okay when I get there. Yeah, well, perhaps yeah. we'll do this again sometime. Maybe we'll even <laughs> run together at some yeah. point. Um, in terms of uh, the the... The fundraising, though. Yeah. Um, what do you want from people? Because it's a good, it's a good place to end, is to tell people specifically yeah. just, uh, okay. what you want, the help you need, and the help you want from us. Yeah. Okay, well, we have a website, runningbitcoin.us, and that's for donations. Uh, I, want, I would love people to run, to uh, let people know about it, tweet, uh, I guess we say now post on X, whatever, mm. uh, uh, let people know that they're doing that uh, just to bring more awareness to people about ALS itself, uh, motor neuron disease itself, and how horrible it is and how there is no cure. Let's get a cure. Let's get the Bitcoin community out there. Let's be the ones who make it possible yes. to have a cure, to change this so that no one else has to go through what Hal went through. Mm. Uh, he changed my life. I mean, you know, it's not hyperbolic to say he had a significant role in changing my life. 
And that, yeah. that's yeah. not just a hype. I, I was in a very different world when I discovered Bitcoin. And I was actually out here in, well, I was in LA and uh, I made friends with a guy who had a podcast. And uh, I'd also discovered Bitcoin and I'd used Bitcoin to buy a treat. My mother had cancer and we wanted to treat her with um, cannabis oil. So I'd used Bitcoin to buy her that. Yeah. And then I'd met this podcaster and I, I was like, oh, I like your life. So I want to copy you. And so you told me how to do it. And I was, he's like, what subject are you going to do? I said, I think Bitcoin. Yeah. And then six years later, I've got a new best friend in Danny. I've got new friends here in Cookie and Bill. We travel the world. We've, I've been to so many different countries because of Bitcoin. I've seen Bitcoin used in desperate places in Venezuela, Lebanon, Argentina, things that have happened that how wouldn't have been aware of but would have absolutely loved. I've seen it change people's lives. Yeah. I've seen it solve problems in countries that have got very desperate economic situations. We've interviewed charities What's where there's there? women who are in abusive financial relationships and Bitcoin is a way they can escape from that. There are so, I could tell you hundreds of stories and uh, my hope was this is everything that, it's doing everything how I hoped it would. He would love to see this and he would be so, he would so enjoy talking with people about it. It, so that's, that's one of the things that, that, I feel overwhelmed with, you know, how supportive everyone is. And then I also think, oh, I wish Al could experience some of this. Yeah. Well, all we can do is just work hard on yeah. promoting and growing Bitcoin yeah. and, and, and doing that in his legacy. That is his legacy. Yeah. 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 I would like to do this again someday with you, if that's possible. Okay. Uh, I, I, I tell you it would be a, probably a very interesting interview if you would like to do it. And we don't ever do this, but I'm sure we could ask people and there'd be lots of questions people would have for you that are important to them. And uh, I would be okay right. with that. I just thought of one thing else that I would like to mention yes. back, uh, back to our challenge, Yes, which is that we're looking for corporate sponsors okay. and uh, people that want to run on teams. I think teams would be really fun. So uh, for if, if people have the idea of just getting together a, a Bitcoin team, any kind of theme. We'll do a What Bitcoin Did team. Yeah, That's that'd be idea. so fantastic. Yeah, I may even get my football team to do it. I, we should do a Santa Barbara team. We should. That'd be fun. Yeah. Well, look, we will do everything we can to support this. We'll stay in touch regularly. And uh, I think uh, next year, uh, when it comes around again, we should do it again. We'll be here okay. at the same time anyway. And it would just be great to stay in touch with you and... and uh, support everything you're doing with the uh, running Bitcoin and ALS. And I have to get you a shirt with the running Bitcoin on the back. I would love that, Peter. Yeah. Thank you. I will get Thank you, a, you. So we'll get your address. Have you got the address? Daniel will get I'm your not, address yeah. and we'll get one sent. <laughs> and we'll get that sent to you. I'll send yeah, it up no, here to I'm Cookie. I'm going to wear that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll send it up here to Cookie. Be fantastic. And, uh, uh, small. <laughs> and look, anything you ever need in the future, you've got our details. Just reach out. We're here to help. Um, Thank and, you, Peter. Uh, the, and Danny. Nothing Thank you, you can't ask us. Thank you. Thank you, friend. <laughs>